Um, I want to congratulate you on the humanitarian award you received at the Junos. Well Thank deserved. you. Well deserved. Thank and you. Tell us about your experience with the ceremony and the whole weekend. Yeah, so we, you know, what, what, what's been great about the Junos, I would say the last 15 years is um, they start with, uh, especially, uh, well, specifically for Indigenous nominees or recipients, um, we have our own honoring ceremony. Uh, and so we had that on the Friday afternoon, so the day before the big gala and a couple of days before the televised event. And it's really quite amazing because um, it sets the tone for us, you know, um, as much as, and we do appreciate the recognition and the acknowledgements generally uh, around the awards themselves. Um, but we know that um, often the awards are not, for us anyway, for me in any way, it's not about an individual receiving an, an acknowledgement or a recognition because the journey itself has never been a single journey, a single person's journey. Uh, so it was very special that we started the whole event with an honoring ceremony on the Friday afternoon. Uh, the gala itself was on the Saturday, and uh, that was pretty special because, of course, the Governor General, um, Mary Simon, Her Excellency Mary Simon, uh, presented the award. Uh, but we also had youth, our youth workers uh, from Nunavut, uh, who were able to join us for the weekend all of the weekend's events and they were there to witness all of this uh this event and the event itself on the saturday night and the televised portion on the saturday so it's just pretty awesome all around what a wonderful experience for them too that's beautiful yeah. that's something they'll yeah. always always remember and hold dear but yes yeah. absolutely yeah now you've won i want to make sure i get this correct have you won three junos plus the humanitarian award yeah, so four in total now, three previously for albums and music, and this one specifically for all of my uh, volunteer work over the years, not just with the Arctic Rose Foundation, mm -hmm. but with other organizations as well. Okay, that's beautiful. Um, how, what made you decide when you were young that music was your path? Um, so mine is not a common story. Um, I left home, home being at the time it was Nunavut, uh, Northwest Territories, Inuit Nunangat, not yet Nunavut, um, 1990, in the fall of 1990, and I left home to leave. I had not had any real experience as an artist, singer, songwriter, any of that. Um, and very quickly and very shortly after moving away from home uh, and moved to Ottawa, I was presented opportunities. Uh, not, not the, the first opportunity was not so much to, to try out music or songwriting per se. Uh, it came in the form of a conversation with my boss at the time. I worked for Indian Affairs. I worked as a translator. And we got to talking about living between two worlds to finish high school. I finished high school in Yellowknife. And uh, we got to talking about that experience and being removed from home and all things familiar to finish grade 10, grade 11, grade 12, away from home. I wrote poetry. So the poem became a conversation piece, which became a video project conversation piece, which became a music video, which got on much music. And I wasn't even a singer songwriter yet. So um, I hadn't. I, I didn't choose the career, you know, it happened. Mm -hmm. Series of happenstances, opportunities from 1990 on led me to the Arctic Rose album a couple of years later, which of course led me to a record deal offer, which led me to OCM, which kind of launched a career from that mm -hmm. point on. So um, it wasn't like this moment of, uh, as a child of, I'm going to be a senior songwriter and that became the goal. Um, you know, it was just right place, right time happened. So that's, that's why I, I kind of call myself the accidental art. It was just a series, series of happenstances and opportunities that turned into this so far, knock on wood, an incredible 30 years. That is incredible. And I'm glad it's been such a wonderful ride for you as well with, uh, with music. What's one of your most memorable performances that you put on? Um... I would say hmm, there's there's been several memorable, memorable for different reasons. <laughs> um, 
The first was Canada's 125th uh, celebration, and that was really, really, really early in my career. And it was pretty incredible because we had uh, the performance noon, noon, noonday performance on Parliament Hill, and it was incredible because the performance was uh, to the Hinanaho song. And we had indigenous dancers. We had First Nations Inuit dancers. Tom Jackson was there. It was, it was pretty awesome, you know, that way uh, that we were able to put on stage all this indigenous talent, uh, yeah. and then to perform Hinanaho to a hun to uh, Canada's 125th. So that meant thousands and thousands and thousands of viewers and live as well. Um, and then the next very memorable moment was uh, short, several couple of years after that, um, getting to perform OCM for Nelson Mandela. So that was oh. pretty awesome. Yeah, that was pretty wow. special. Um, right up there also was getting to meet Billy Graham, whose organization asked for me to perform my songs, even though I've always been very honest about being a Christian but not a Christian artist. So I'm not a gospel artist, but I, I am a Christian. Um, and I made that very clear to them. And they still, we want to hear your OCM. We want to hear your Hinanaho. So getting to do that for Billy Graham was pretty special. Um, and then, of course, uh, having a chance to speak bluntly at our 150th. You know, we knew that uh, leading up to the 150th is all these issues as Indigenous people that finally have a forefront and a place. Um, and then being very honest when they invited me to say a few words that then you have to let me be honest uh, and acknowledge the times that we are living in as Canadians that we have all this work to do and they and they of course it well of course uh, so the 150th 25 years later um, and and the state and place we're in socially and politically as Canadians indigenous and non um, having that platform to be honest about uh, the work that needs to be done, the places that we're in, the uncomfortable places we have to navigate together and mm -hmm. having that place to share that. So they're pretty, uh, pretty special moments there. Oh, no mm -hmm. kidding. I know that Crystal is going to definitely um, discuss some Indigenous topics with you shortly. I just wanted uh -huh. to ask a few more musical related ones. Um, mm -hmm. now, how, have you, how have you taken care of your singing voice over the years as well? Um, I learned very early on um, that the voice is not, it's not just the voice, it's the body. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I, I made a very conscious decision many, many years ago to be as healthy as I can be. Now, my nature uh, is a very frantic one. I'm generally a very frantic person. So I had to um, harness that in my process. So uh, what that meant was um, I can get very physical very fast. Uh, so yoga, weights, all that stuff early on. Mm. Um, I'm not a smoker. I've never smoked. I've never drank. So I made those kinds of decisions. So ha habit, I'm, I'm a habitual person. So I stayed away from those things and harness the other healthier things as part of my frantic uh, habit forming side <laughs> of my yeah. life. Um, and I'm not now at this point in my life very um, disciplined in that area, but it sure paid off when I was younger because that's when we were really crazy busy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the morning often started with a workout and a vocal exercise, a warm up, a nice steam shower, all these very intentional things you do to take care of your body because your body is your voice. Um, and then the mind, you know, I, I learned, and I've been very fortunate that my, my career has also been my healer. So making very intentional plans around, um, uh, ramping up and ramping down, going into a show like this example, this, this weekend in the Junos, for example, uh, because we had youth participants, we were able to incorporate and our foundation's work is expressive art. We were able to incorporate in our weekends, uh, the Saturday morning, Sunday morning time with them all doing expressive art. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, that's been a part of my life from the very beginning is whatever art I can make part of my day is part of my ramping up for that day. And then if I have time in the evening, I will ramp down uh, with my art. Um, versus uh, going out and doing something I'm going to regret the next day. <laughs> so <laughs> That's inspiring, um, yeah. Because like, yeah. there's something about that and having that kind of a routine 
and just filling your life with something inspirational, right? Instead of just party, party, party. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, and I understand it. Um, you know, it's per performing is, is an exhausting thing every day. So if you're on tour at your day starts, um, you're technically your day starts when you are at your venue. So some of us go there at noon, some of us go there at one. Mm -hmm. um, when you walk out the door, you're on. That's when your day starts. 10, 11 in the morning is when you're on and your day starts. And you don't shut off until 10, 11 midnight. So you're looking at 10, 12 hour days of um, being on to perform. But really, your day starts when you wake up. So my morning routine, uh, my breakfast, getting ready for the, for the day to start, and then the day starts. So when you're touring, you've got 10, 14, 16 hour days. So it's easy to get into the other habits because you're mentally, physically tired. Mm. Uh, and I understand that. I understand there have been days where I was really tempted. Uh, I've never drank, I've never smoked, but I've certainly been tempted because you're just mm. so emotionally, physically tired. So I understand when that happens. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a wonderful thing to hear. And I'm really happy and congratulations on, you know, taking that good care of yourself mentally, physically. Mm. Um, now, there are a lot of amazing recent Indigenous artists out there who are doing big things. Who are some of your favorites that you know of and you would consider maybe collaborating with in the future? Um, wow. I've wanted to, and we have tried for the last couple of years to connect uh, Flora Vola, uh, the other half of Cashton. Mm. Um, so we have been slowly, we've known each other forever, but we've been slowly trying to co coordinate how we write a song together and then record a song together. So he's always been somebody I've wanted to, 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 um, to collaborate with. Um, William Prince is pretty awesome, you know, and I, I first heard him uh, about, so it was a year before the pandemic, so about three or four years ago, we were at an event together in Calgary, actually in Calgary, Alberta, and uh, I got to hear him and just his guitar, and then I knew that's a very powerful voice. Now, whether we collaborate or not, uh, I would love to share the stage with him at some point. I'd love to just take all these incredible artists on tour, just get us out there <laughs> playing together, share our music. Um, yeah, there's so many. There's just so many. I, I you know, and I, I, we just released our 10th album, but on, on my to wow. record next will be a collaboration album because there's so many that uh, I would love to create something with. So I think my next project is going to be all collaborations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That would be so fun. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorites is Kaylee Cardinal because she's a friend of mine. She's from here in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. So okay. it was really good to see her like winning a Juno a couple years back. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a nice collaboration too. Mm. <laughs> what country besides Canada has really embraced your music? Have you got to travel to different places to perform? There's the irony, you know, I feel like um, it's been an interesting journey in terms of um, how much success we've had commercially. You know, I, I've been very fortunate that I've had that debut album success, but that was 25, 26 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we had that success because in 95, 96, radio's format changed for us for a, a window of time so country radio was new country for a little while in 95 96 yeah. and this child came out in that in that slot so we happened to fit that format for a while and then radio changed back to something so this child was very successful the follow-up album unsung heroes uh we released two years later uh, and radio was changing. But the other thing that was happening was um, we were getting Napster. We were getting this this new way of sharing music. Uh, and of course, the industry was kind of pivoting to that. So Unsung Heroes <laughs> kind of got forgotten. So that when you're not on radio, you're not really getting the work. So I was 
totally ready to tour. Cause I was, I found in the early years from Arctic Rose to this child, we toured this child as an artist and as a singer, I wasn't quite ready. I had a lot of learning and catching up to do. And I was figuring out how to take care of my voice and my body. All that was happening while touring this child. Mm. But then between this child and unsung heroes, the follow up album, I had that time to really catch up with how to perform better, how to sing better. And then the business changed. So we weren't getting the tours. So I was like, but I'm ready. I want to do this. <laughs> And then the machine kept changing. So I feel like I've never quite caught up with the machine. But in the meantime, I'm ready. I've been performing. I've fallen in love with the stage. I've fallen in love with singing. Uh, so it's it's been a bit tricky to get to get us back out there, but we've done a lot of public speaking. We've kept us kept ourselves going so that we stay stay relevant. I mean, we're we've released our 10th album. All that to say, um, we haven't released outside of Canada yet. Mm. So I'm, I am, our, we're ready to just do something with this new album, get it out there, find a record label that will just get it out there for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're ready to go. I will go anywhere. I will play anywhere. Because <laughs> we love to play and the band loves yeah. to play together. So we're, um, we're waiting for that opportunity. And it'd be have some nice experiences checking out other countries and, and just doing the travel uh, as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to welcome my good friend, Crystal here. She's a wonderful member of our community here in Edmonton. Um, she'll, she's going to tell you a bit about what she does and uh, she's got a lot of um, amazing questions and people had a few things they wanted to share with you. So. Okay. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you. Yeah. So, Tanse, Susan, um, I'm Crystal Plant. I am from Driftpile, Alberta, in the Treaty 8 area. I myself um, work full time at the Stollery Children's Hospital with the Awasasuk Indigenous Health Program as a child and family engagement coordinator. So, um, mm -hmm. Naomi, she asked me to be a part of this podcast. And I just want to note that Naomi is a very dear friend of mine. Uh, so close that she's like family to me. So I'm very honored mm -hmm. to be here today and help assist with this. And um, what I thought would be really neat is to reach out to my Indigenous connections, my coworkers, my colleagues, just ask um, them some insights about what they know about your music and what you've meant to them um, as a, an Indigenous person. So, you know, um, I'm going to start off with... Um, um, this first sentiment from my coworker, her name's Sharon Glover, and she's the RN case manager with the Owasasuk team at the Stollery. And uh, she was a nurse in the Arctic for over, I believe, uh, 12 years. And so she has a huge wealth of knowledge, but she did want me to share this with you and I'm just gonna read it to you. So mm. I, re I remember the first time I heard one of Su Susan Aglu Clark's songs, the words and music had a way to reach out and touch your very soul. My favorite song of hers is The Child. What I appreciate the most about Susan was when she was courageous enough to share publicly her experience with postpartum depression. So as a labor and delivery nurse in the Arctic for over 12 years, the knowledge that Susan was open about with her dealing with postpartum depression gave hope to so many of her postpartum patients. There was a real person's face to put on postpartum depression. And even better was the fact that Susan was from the Arctic and was famous. It helped my patients realize that this condition was nothing to hide from or think of themselves as failures as a new mom. I don't know how many times over the 12 years in the Arctic, I used Susan's experience as part of my way to help postpartum patients. Susan, you empowered these women and not just through your music. For this, I will be forever grateful. Miigwech, she says. So, okay. oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, with that being said, I, I know you incorporate a lot of teachings with your songs, and I'm just wondering, what are some of your favorite teachings that you sing about? Um. So, for the first album, Arctic Rose, um, and. In the, in the early years, what I discovered I was doing was unlearning. And what's important to, to know about my journey is um, I come from 
uh, an environment, a very small town, and I loved it. I loved my childhood. I loved everything about my culture, and I still do, and I go home often, and I spend time in my community and with my parents, my family. Um, but when I talk about environment, I'm talking about the environment of crisis, not our traditional culture or our traditional community. Mm -hmm. um, and what I what I discovered uh, and come to know now um, is that in those early years of my career from the Arctic Rose on for a couple of years, I was unlearning um, a lot of things that I, I realize now and we still deal with as Indigenous people um, were normal, but are not actually normal. We think that they are normal, some of our behaviors around situations. So for example, uh, when I first moved to Ottawa and I had this great job and I had my own apartment, I was a young person, 21, 22, 23 years old. And I had this, this whole life before me, before the singing and songwriting, but I always felt a little out of place. So I knew that I was different. Um, the community I was living in Ottawa um, and, and the circumstances I was living in being, meaning, um, I wanted to get in the bus, but I was, I was, ilirasuk is the word I use, emotional fear, essentially institutionalized. So I thought I had to ask permission every time I wanted to get on the bus because the bus driver was a white person. And everything I'm sharing is not, uh, a, um, a negative necessarily comment about the white versus non-white in the context of what I was learning or unlearning. Um, but it was very important for me when I came to discover that I had essentially been an institutionalized Indigenous person when I first moved to Ottawa. And so it was those behaviors I was unlearning. Um, and so I think what we have to become comfortable with and what I acknowledged I had to do and was doing was it's okay to be vulnerable in these environments and in these situations. We don't have to always be strong in those situations. Uh, when we feel uncomfortable, um, we have to feel uh, the vulnerability in that discomfort. There doesn't have to be answers. It is what it is. Having said that, uh, it's also the role of the other person to receive it uh, in a gentle way. And I think that's what we're dealing with now in this country is we're learning to navigate what those those situations are. Uh, mm -hmm. Essentially, I call it um, correcting our narrative. We're, we're relearning uh, and reshifting how we own the environments we're in and we're gonna go through these uncomfortable things for a while. Um, and that was the hardest lesson for myself to learn was I want this life and I have to own it. And I can't be controlled by the environment or anybody around me because I'm a good, strong, indigenous singer songwriter and I want to do this. I want this job. Uh, and so to do it, I have to get healthy, as healthy as I can be. And part of it was I can be vulnerable in, the, in some of these processes and we have to learn to be okay with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I work with uh, some no Northern families when they come to the hospital and they're um, plopped down into this institution, right? And mm -hmm. um, I just see uh, their journeys just trying to navigate their ways through this complex medical system. And yeah, um, just that vulnerability, it's okay to be vulnerable, you know? I, I just see so many mamas and just trying to be so strong, but you know, it's okay to let go and just release in those times. So I yeah. really appreciate you sharing that. Um, I'm gonna uh, move on to my next question. This one is from Pauline Cardinal. So she is from Big Stone Cree Nation and I had the immense honor of, she worked with the Owasasic program at one point as a indigenous pediatric social worker. So she's a big fan of yours. She's uh, she mm -hmm. <laughs> she expressed so many times she was so excited uh, that I was going to be a part of this. So her question was, "What is the meaning around the song Hina Naho? Because it's been around the north for so long. What made you want to make it a hit song? And did you think it would be such a big hit?" Um. So that's a very good question because um, when we when we were in the studio working on this child, this child is what we call the first major label debut album. So Arctic Rose was independent, meaning on our own at Blue Clark Entertainment. 
and then we signed a record deal and EMI was our record label and that this child was the first project with EMI. Um, and so all of us went into this, myself, my manager, the agent, everybody that was involved thinking, let's just see what happens. Nobody, none of us was prepared for the success of this child, the album. And so when we released singles to radio and they kept charting, it was like, whoa, we got something here. This is huge. So what that means is when we wrote OCM and we wrote Hinanaho and we wrote Shamaya and Breaking Down, those were the four singles off of this child. None of us went in there to go and say to radio, this is a hit song, can you play it? We had no idea. We had no idea they were gonna be hit songs. Hinanaho, uh, OCM and Hinanaho actually are First Nations uh, languages. So I'm an Inuk, so there are three indigenous groups, as you know, I'm Inuit, one distinct indigenous group from the First Nations, another distinct from Métis, three indigenous distinct groups here in Canada. So OCM is Coast Salish, Hinanaho is Dene. And I first mm -hmm. heard Hinanaho uh, from John Landry uh, during, uh, just before we started, um, or was it just after we started writing Arctic Rose. Uh, and we got permission from John Landry and that Dene community outside of Yellowknife to use um, that drum song in a song. We hadn't written it yet. Uh, and so what they described, and we asked them what give us the story behind Hinanaho, and it's a drum song, which is to say Hinanaho is not language. It's the chant behind the drum song and it celebrates the end of winter and spring and summer just around the corner was the description John Landry gave me. Mm -hmm. So it's not words per se. It's part of the drum song chant, Hinana Ho Ho Hine. Uh, so um, yeah, that's that's the story I was getting from John Landry and, and it's from the Dene in the Yellowknife area. Wow, amazing. <laughs> Thank you for uh -huh. teaching me that. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, she just had another question. Uh, for any up-and-coming Indigenous artists, what can you share from your experience in the music industry? Anything good? The good, the bad, the ugly type scenario? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was very fortunate. Um, I was so naive going into my early career that at first, I just wasn't ready for any major record deal. So between Arctic Rose and This Child were all these phone calls. And I said, no, no, I'm not a singer. I'm not a songwriter. I'm going to fly airplanes. That's what I was going to do. <laughs> and then, um, you know, this little light comes on. What's the matter with you? You're being offered record deals. At the end of the day, it was very, very scary. I had so much to learn, and I didn't think that I could catch up with that learning that at first, I just didn't want to do it. Be very, very honest with yourself. Uh, be very truthful with yourself. Don't compromise yourself for what we think is going to be a, a big su successful celebrity career. If you want to be a celebrity, that's a completely different machine than being a good artist. Two completely different machines. Sometimes if you're very lucky, the two merge and you can be a very successful artist. But as we see now, there's a lot of celebrities who are really good at being celebrities, very famous people. And then there are those who are really good artists. So you have to choose what do you want to be and chase, chase that. I say, if you wanna be a singer songwriter, spend a lot of time writing and not just songwriting, but other forms of writing, write short stories, write little paragraphs every day, write a line every day, do something every day that gets your creative writing juices going every day. That's my challenge to you is make sure that you're always writing if you wanna be a songwriter um, and never compromise self. Find a team and build a team that honors who you are as an indigenous and as, an, as a singer songwriter, as an artist. We're living in times when we are creating capacity uh, to support us. I, I, I'm not a wealthy person. I made a choice a long time ago that I wanted this career because it was healing me, not because I wanted celebrity, but I was healing in a place I didn't know I was broken until this career. And that became the pursuit. And the business side of it that I've had to learn as well, um, is where I make a living. Um, so think long-term 
and be responsible with your long-term plan, but never compromise yourself and do your own writing if you're going to be a singer-songwriter. Wow. That's some of the best advice I've heard for young artists, <laughs> honestly. Mm. Thank you, Susan. Words of wisdom, for sure. Wow. Um, so I, this next uh, segment is from Noella Cardinal. She's from Frog Lake, Alberta. She actually works in the hospital with me, She, but for, with a different Indigenous program. So she's a cultural helper and she's with the Indigenous Wellness Corps. Now, she just wanted to share a sentiment of what her thoughts were when she first heard OZM and uh, her first introduction to you. So I'll get Naomi to play a sound clip for you. And mm -hmm. it's in two pieces, so. Okay, okay, I'm ready. Susan at Glucart was out on the radio when I grew up. We had two channels. We had certain radio stations that we'd be able to catch music. And Susan at Glucart's uh, OCM came on and it was... It was part of the top 10 and I remember loving that song and not being able to see the video until some time after. Like, I knew the words and the rhythm to the song by the time I seen the video and when I saw the video. Uh, you know, a lot of times we're loving music and we, uh, we don't really get it and uh, we need that visual piece. And <laughs> I know when I'm young, I, and even today, I'm not sure what I'm singing to or what I what I'm singing, but I love it. Hmm. And I loved OCM and I was so surprised and I seen, I knew nothing about. Oh, next part here. Just seeing the visuals in her video, it was surprising to me. Uh, she'd put so much uh, of her people and and part of the the rich culture and tradition that's that's still there and that a lot of us don't know about and didn't know about especially uh, back then you know now we have access to uh, so much information but back then no it was whatever you got on tv on the two channels that you had in my case and uh, the radio station so i remember being interested and proud because of who she was and where she came from and how that connected to Canada and to the history of the people. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, I want to thank you uh, as well. You know, I was just a young girl in the nineties, uh, growing up in rural Alberta in a town with very few Indigenous people. And you were my first introduction to the North. So, um, you know, uh, just not knowing your history, like, you know, not knowing about residential schools until I was in my 20s. And, you know, just being so disconnected from, you know, all this rich, vibrant culture that's across Turtle Island. You, um, I give great thanks for, um, you know, being that uh, representation and my introduction to the beautiful, beautiful uh, folks of the North and the culture. So hi, hi for that. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I'm gonna uh, just end things off. Now, this is, an, it's not a musical question, but it is from a very big fan of yours and somebody from the North as well. So her name is Melinda Labacan, and uh, she runs a company called Global Care, which is um, a company based in Edmonton that fully supports the folks that have to travel down south for medical care. So Global Care is uh, rooted in an unwavering commitment to the care and well-being of Northerners. And um, just a little about her is uh, she's had formal and informal training in end of life care, cancer survivor care, addiction support and chronic disease management. She incorporates traditional Western knowledge and healing and patient care. Melinda has led numerous community health initiatives, including launching the first community cancer care program in the Northwest Territories. So um, she has a very uh, strong and powerful story of herself and her, with her own family accessing care um, down here. Um, 
Uh, so from your perspective as such a well-known Northern advocate, how do you think systems can be improved or changed for medical care going South? And I'm saying this question in honor of Melinda. Hmm, thank you. Um, I think but at the top of my list is we need to set up systems so that they don't have to travel south. Mm -hmm. I wish I wish that we could create um, a, we invest as much in the reverse as we do in them traveling south. And I say that because we just had the experience where um, my father ended up in a home in Ottawa, so so removed from his home, and he was always so homesick, and um, it, it just. It just and and driving to Ottawa as much as I can to go and make sure that everybody was okay there and it, it wasn't right. I and you know and you appreciate the care uh, that is being offered and that is being given, um, but these are traditional, highly respected elders of our community, mm -hmm. um, and they're and they were born traditionally on the land. And they're traditional indigenous people, in, in, Inuit in my, my father's case. Um, and their end of year should be at home. It should be on their land. It should be in their community with their people, their food, them as indigenous people. Um, I, I think we need to figure out, all levels of government need to figure out uh, that, how to offer that, how to create that. We spend as much energy and money offering that service in the South. We gotta figure out how to reverse that. That's the top of my list. Having said that, how do we recreate that wherever they end up? Mm -hmm. um, what, one of my observations in Ottawa is we need to train in, um, in, in our urban communities. Edmonton is one. There's a very large Inuit community in Edmonton, for example. Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we utilize them to offer the services and the care in those facilities. What do we need to do differently um, so that we train them and give them the jobs because we know uniquely as Indigenous how to offer those services to our fellow Indigenous. Because we know. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we utilize them? What are the training steps we need to figure out to train them to do those jobs so that when they and they have to go to the south, Edmonton is south, Ottawa is south, Winnipeg is south, mm -hmm. um, that we provide that service for them uniquely, because we know them. So that's the second. I guess the third is at the very minimum, and I'm sure you know this, and you've done this yourself in your in your work, create at least an emotional, and this is the mandate of the Arctic Rose Foundation, emotional, physical, cultural, spiritual, safe space mm -hmm. in your facility. Mm -hmm. Create that for them so they know in that room, they're safe. Mm -hmm. At least do that. I think those would be my three responses. That's absolutely fantastic. And I'm, I'm very proud to say, say at the Stollery, we, we have created that safe space for our folks to come to. It's actually been nicknamed the Cousin Station <laughs> because mm. they feel so like um, comfortable and uh, just the, the laughter and the stories that is shared in that space. Like I can't even uh, begin to explain, you know, people come to the Stollery from all across Turtle Island and they bring their teachings with them. And then they share those teachings within that room. So, um, yes, hmm. I can completely agree that those safe spaces need to be in place. So thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, hi, for answering my questions. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just have a just a few more questions and then we'll be wrapping things up. Um, okay. I think it's incredible that you have received the, the Order of Canada. Um, it's a huge accolade. And what does that enable you to do with that, with that order? Um, so I, with that, I, I've been, I've created this uh, wonderful group of supporters from, from that circle. Uh, and I think those supports and allyships are critical um, as we navigate reconciliation. You know, reconciliation doesn't mean 
uh, this line and it's them on that side, this on this side. What we're trying to navigate here and what we're trying to figure out is how to, in as healthy a way as possible, create uh, the spaces we as Indigenous are honored and we have our way of living in these spaces and they have their way of living and then we live together. Uh, and and we figure out the history. We have to we have to figure out the history of how we got here. We figured it out. How do we make it part of this healthy moving forward? Um, so what the Order of Canada has given me access to are these incredible allies, and we have them. We have allies in this country who want to honor um, and help uh, navigate and create the steps moving forward and they are those those people are part of that uh, re very respectful moving forward conversation honoring the processes that have to take place even before we can really truly begin that reconciliation conversation there's all these things that need to happen that are happening uh, and that's this order of canada has given me access to those people. They're part of the work we are doing. And it's it's been pretty eye-opening and a major learning process for me as well, because as an Indigenous person, I've had this boundary. It's like, mm, I don't feel right with you. I don't feel right with you. And, and you second guess and hesitate to be comfortable in those conversations because you've had bad experiences. Mm. Um, these people have my back. So I know now I can take those steps and do the things and say the things we need to do and say uh, moving forward. I'm glad that we can have these conversations. And like you said, it's a process. It's got to be put into place ahead of time. It can't, it, you know, and thank you for being here to share that with us. I know a lot of people want to get involved, <clears throat> like with the Arctic Rose Foundation and such. How can they do that? How, how can somebody like myself get involved with the organization and help and learn? Yep. Thank you for that. Yep. So um, we have our website, arcticrose.org. All the information is there and the option to donate is there as well. Our mandate is emotional, physical, cultural, spiritual, safe places. And what we're doing is we are in three Nunavut communities. We have a goal of being in five this fall. If the money is all in place, we have, we have enough to keep the three going and we want to add two. Our mandate is Northern children and youth. So not just Inuit, but First Nations and Métis as well. So any, any community reserve, urban center that wants to uh, access the programs or partner in program development can reach out to the arcticrose.org and we will figure out how to find the money, raise the money so that we add as many. And the goal is to be in every single one that asks. I would like to be in every Inuit community, every reserve, because I think art, drama, music should be accessible to our youth and children whenever they want it. So the goal is to be in as many places as possible. So go to the website, make a donation if you can. Uh, but uh, the information is all there, uh, what we provide uh, through the foundation. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, what are your current music projects? What goals are lying ahead here for what's coming up around the corner? Yeah, so we've uh, just released our 10th album, came out April 29. It's called The Crossing, uh, and it can be purchased online. Most of your most of your social media platforms, uh, iTunes has it, um, Spotify has it. Uh, a copy can be purchased through idla.ca, and that's the label it's with, idla.ca. So a copy of the album can be purchased there. Um, but it is available online as well. Uh, and that's our 10th album. And it's really, um, it's about the, uh, the journey of the ancestors. You know, I feel like as we move forward and we're healing, we must, we must use and utilize those stories as part of the healing journey. Uh, the more we connect to that story, the more we connect to a, a central self that becomes part of our reconciliation conversation, the healing conversation, all of those parts. But we have to incorporate culture and our history in that in that part of the journey. So uh, the crossing, uh, there's some songs in there that talk about what that time must have been like for my ancestors. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's wonderful. And mm -hmm. I like that you say we are our 10th album, you know, like just incorporating everybody <laughs> who's been involved in your career. And I think that's beautiful. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. And 
Thank you once again for being here today. I feel so honored to have met you this way and had this chance to talk with you, Susan. And Crystal, thank do you, you have anything you'd like to say? Oh, yeah, just thank you from the bottom of my heart. You know, this is an absolute dream come true to be able to talk to you and be face to face <laughs> like this. I just appreciate your insights and wisdom and I'll carry your teachings um, in my heart forever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Actually, we are coming to Edmonton this, this summer uh, for two concerts. So uh, we'll be posting the dates uh, in the next little while on the um, on my social media pages, but we are coming to Edmonton this summer for two concerts. Oh, wow. Wonderful. Well, me and Naomi will be there with bells on for sure. Come and, come and say hi, please. I'd love to meet you in person. I would Absolutely. love that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and thank you for thank you for teaching so much. I appreciate you. And thank I you. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And I'll I will. Tag thank you. you. I'll, I'll tag you in the social media when this episode comes out. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. You guys take care. You too. Bye. Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.